Good afternoon. Today on Mihas International, I'm speaking with writer and author Monica Connell. Uh, Monica studied social anthropology at o Oxford and uh, she's written several books, including Against a Peacock Sky, um, which describes her experiences whilst living for two years in a remote village. And this was in northwestern Nepal in the early 1980s. And it was translated into German and into Dutch. And she recently trained as a photographer and published two illustrated books. Uh, one of them was entitled uh, Flying High, New Circus in Bristol, and Music and Dance from Many Cultures, uh, Universal Passion. And um, her latest book, Gathering Karagin, is about her return to uh, a little village in Donegal, which she knew as a child. And this is going to be published in 2015. And she currently lives in a farmhouse in Andalusia. So, uh, so far, she's led a very busy life. Good afternoon, Monica. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, yes, definitely a busy life. I ought to say as well that um, the Against a Peacock Sky uh, is part of the classic travel uh, books and was republished. I mean, it was originally published in 1993, but republished this year in June 2014. Yes, it was ori originally published in 1993 by Penguin. Um, and then it went out of print after a while, as books tend to do. Um, but it was recently picked up by this publisher in London, whose mission it, it, it is to keep um, classic travel books in print. Mm -hmm. So I owe them a debt, and I'm really, really honoured that it's considered a classic travel a book. classic travel book, mm. yes. Um, now, people will be wondering um, why you went all the way to Nepal um, yes. in the first place. Yes, good in question. The 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was studying social anthropology, as I think you said in the introduction, and I went there to do my field work for a PhD in anthropology. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that was, it usually takes about two years, which is the time I spent there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I presume a village like that, you'd um, be travelling back in time. They wouldn't have all the modern things that we have. Uh, everything, it would be quite a hard life, wouldn't it? Extremely hard. Mm. Um, there was no running water or electricity, so, you know, for the toilet you used the bushes and for the bathroom it was the stream. Okay. There were no communications with the outside world, no television. There were a few radios, but they were almost always without batteries. Mm -hmm. And um, pretty much everything the people needed or ate, they grew or made. Um, so men's clothes, for example, were made out of wool, which they sheared from their own sheep and then spun and wove and stitched. So they had the kind of um, baggy trousers and jackets all made from wool. Okay. And women washed their hair in, in mud and washed dishes in with a scrubbing with charcoal and ash. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes, because you so, were in mud houses as well, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And for lighting, they used um, splints of um, pine wood which were gouged from deep inside the biggest trees while the tree was still standing. Mm -hmm. And then they just carried these around the village like we would a torch or inside after dark. They put it on the hearth to light up the room, but there was nothing more than that. Oh, gosh. And of course, you'd have all the smoke from it as well that you'd be breathing smoke in. Smoke with something else altogether. The smoke situation was terrible, yeah. Mm -hmm. And those um, lighting strips, they gave off really black smoke. Oh so that your hands and your ankles and face would be not just black so you could wash it off, but permanently ingrained with this sooty stuff. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Might protect you against all the elements, though. <laughs> well, yes, there is that. <laughs> <laughs> and did you find the difference in the language a barrier, or you were able to overcome this quite easily? No, it was a huge barrier. Well, I did get over it, um, I, I learnt Nepali in London. When I was studying at Oxford, I went to um, London twice a week for Nepali classes. And then when I went to Kathmandu, which is the capital of N Nepal, I went to more classes. And then, of course, when I got to the village, it was a completely different, different. dialect. Yeah. And, um, but nobody there spoke English, so I just had to muddle through. Okay. Yeah. And... Um... 
how did they accept you? You know, the, 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 for instance, the well, children would never have seen any foreign people, would they? A lot of people had never seen any yeah. foreigners. Um, they they did accept us, um, but they were very curious, and we never had any privacy, which I think was one of the very hardest thing mm -hmm. things. Um, we were living with a, um, a family. They had very very big houses of um, stone and mud, which um, which housed three families usually. You know, a brother and his wife, mm -hmm. another brother and his wife, and kids, and so on. And we were given a wing of one of those houses. So we had. I was there with my partner Peter. I don't think I mentioned that. So we had a little home of our own. Mm -hmm. um, but outside the roof was communal. It was where a flat roof where people um, work with their grain and dry grain and sit just because the sun's usually warm during the daytime and the, the houses are cold. Uh -huh. And so it was public space that. And people would just come up to us. The kids would come up to us and they'd point and touch. And, you know, kind of... They don't seem to have moles, the people in the village, and they're very curious about any moles we had. <laughs> and Peter had blonde hair. I mean, oh. I blended in a bit more easily, but yes. he had blonde hair. That would be totally so, different. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. they'd shout, Deshi, 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 as soon as you walked into the village, which just means foreigner, foreigner. Oh, okay. okay. So, yeah, lack of privacy was quite a big thing. Was one of the big things. Yeah, yeah. Um, but although it was... It was pretty hard for you, and you helped in the everyday life, didn't yes, you? you did yes, the I worked as in the well. fields, and yeah. yeah, I mean, just even for us, I mean, we had a few extra things, but not many. Just you know, keeping body and soul together was um, hard work. It took mm -hmm. a lot of time. And do you have some fond memories? Of, yes, yeah. I do have very fond memories. Um, our relationship with the family who shared, who, whose home we shared was very, very good. And it got to be better and better, obviously, the more Nepali we could speak. Yeah. And the father of the family taught us how to brew barley beer. So we'd, we'd brew that together, and when his had run out, ours would be ready. So, you know, sometimes in the evening we'd sit around just drinking beer and, mm -hmm. you know, chewing the fat. <laughs> and there was a, the, the daughter of this family, who must have been about um, 10, I think, very young girl. Mm -hmm. she became, I became very close to her. I really loved her in the yeah. way that I would have done a child oh, I love um, of my own. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yes, you, you developed a really strong... Yes, yes. Do you keep in touch with them? I, I don't really, because... Um, I suppose it'd be difficult in those days, wouldn't it? Well, no, no telephones, yeah. no nothing. Yeah. But um, I haven't been back, um, mainly because I think it was just such an overwhelming experience at the time that I feel, um, I feel a bit apprehensive about going there and seeing the things that have changed mm -hmm. and just exposing myself to so much emotion again. Yes. But Peter, my partner, has been back mm -hmm. and he says, yes, it's changed a lot. It's that 10-year-old that girl, when the last time he went, had, you know, five children. And, oh, my goodness. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yes, and so. of course people die early yes. as well. Yeah, they do because yeah. of such a hard life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose maybe some of the hardship type memories for you would have been no running water, no electricity. Yes, and the general smoke in the room because mm. for heating and cooking we used a fire just in the centre of the room and there was no chimney. Um, so the smoke just seeped out through the eaves very yeah. slowly, but always in the room. Oh. There was a thick cloud of smoke and your eyes would just stream and you'd yeah. cough and everything. So, yeah, it was hard. It that. was hard. In the end, we were allowed to cut a chimney in the roof. Oh, were you? But we had yeah. to placate the household spirits because otherwise... Um, the household gods, because otherwise evil spirits would have come down the hole in the chimney. Oh, yes, of so course. So we had a little ritual. Very superstitious yeah, as well very. because of, you know, the... They weren't so influenced by Western civilization, were they? No, no. Uh, was there any? I mean, was there any special festivals they had as yes, well? Yes, yeah, there were wonderful festivals. Um, on three or four full moons every year, they had a big festival on one of these flat roofs of one of the houses, and they had a row of drummers bashing on these massive um, kettle drums, huge things, and they would beat them as hard as they could, and there was a real racket. 
and that was to summon the gods to the village. And when the gods had the gods descended and um, possessed the shamans who started dancing. And um, so these guys, they were wearing all white, the only people in the village who were wearing all white. Uh They danced with these bells just completely manically. And that was when the gods were inside them, possessing them. Ah, right. And then people could ask them questions about, you know, why have my crops failed this year? Why has my husband left me? Oh, Interesting. <laughs> yes. Well, I didn't have to ask him that one, but yes. No, no you didn't. <laughs> but others might have done. Yes, oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the clairvoyancy and mediumship in, yes, in their yeah, village. Yes. Yeah. And if you imagine that, the noise and the dancing, and the, they wore garlands of marigolds as well when they mm. were in season, yes. and the white um, in the full moon yes, with the very noise dramatic. of the drums. It was terribly yeah. dramatic, yeah. And that's what I've been wondering, I've been intrigued about where the title came from, Against a Peacock Sky. Yes, it was just a line from the book, really, and um, actually it was a publisher who suggested that. I wanted to call it something boring, like Rhythms of a Himalayan Village or something, and they said, no, let's go for something a bit more catchy. Mm-hmm. But it was actually... I was describing a scene that I'd watched, which was the father of the house um, Mm -hmm. winnowing grain in a fan winnow, which is um, when you want to separate the chaff, the loose husks from the grain, you do this and it blows away in the wind. And all this loose chaff was blowing against a bright blue sky. In fact, imagine it's a bit like the colour of this background. Yes. And I was talking about that happening against a peacock sky. Oh, it sounds lovely, doesn't it? <laughs> Trying to picture it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds lovely. Yeah. Um, so, yes, that's been uh, republished yes. as a classic. As a classic, book, yes. Uh, this year. And um, you recently trained as a photographer. Um, yes. Why did you decide to do that? Well, writing is quite hard. You spend long periods of mm. time just with your head down on your own banging your head against the desk half the time, you know, and wondering Mm. why it's going so badly and not getting any kind of feedback or interaction until you've finished a book. And even then, there's no guarantee of it being published, of course. True. So I wanted something a bit more immediate, some way of um, expressing something artistic inside me that um, was a bit more immediate and a bit more, a bit easier for me, I suppose. Yeah. Because I do find writing quite hard. Okay, um, but do it so very well. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll talk about one of the books uh, quickly, The Flying High, The New Circus in Bristol. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I was talking to you um, earlier, and um, I mean, this picture here on the screen here is fantastic, it really is. <laughs> but I was talking to you and you said, circus is a very important thing in Bristol, isn't yeah, it? Yes, circus um, is a huge thing. It's kind of like a, um, an alternative art form that's springing up all over the place. But there is also a circus school that's internationally known that's been going for, what, 30 years, I think? Mm -hmm. Maybe more. Um, And people go there, more and more people go there to learn circus skills. Uh And, um, I mean, circus has obviously changed a a huge amount since um, animals were banned or disapproved of performing in circuses. And in Bristol also there is a kind of very contemporary circus scene where um, this company called the Invisible Circus um, take, in, take on um, derelict buildings. They took on an old Victorian um, fire and police station in the very centre of Bristol. Mm-hmm. And they did it up to... This was with the owners and the developers' permission. And they did it up to kind of health and safety standards. And then they let out rooms in it as... Um, artist studios but they also performed these occasional incredibly weird and wonderful circus parties thousands of people came to them and they had one that was um, the theme of a Dickensian village (laughs) and they had um, you know an old-fashioned hairdresser and um, prostitutes beckoning from the shadows and and all (laughs) sorts of things And, and, and people had to if you came as a customer you had to interact Yes. And they also had a little stage where they did more conventional circus skills like juggling oh. and um, 
Yes, aerobics. all the things that go with yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, so, not aerobics. What are they called? Acrobatics. Aerialism. Uh, aer aerial. Yeah, they had aerialists. Yeah, aer aerobics. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, um, something quite, uh, well, very different and dramatic. And as you yeah. say, the, the, the feats that they do with their bodies yeah, is incredible, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it is incredible. It is. Yeah. Almost like not Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is, isn't yeah, it? So yeah. Along those lines. Um, now, your latest book, which is published in 2015, mm -hmm. is uh, Gathering uh, Carrigan, which is a red seaweed. Um, and it's called that, I presume, because that's part of the story of your book as well. That's right. And uh, you returned to live in a Donegal village, uh, which you knew as a child and used to visit with your yes. family. Yes, yes. Um, and you talk about the changes, or, or perhaps not so many changes, and you have dealings with a... Um, a lobster fisherman, mm -hmm. a trawler person, and the lady that collects uh, the carrageen mm -hmm. as well on the, mm -hmm. the seaweed, isn't it? Red mm -hmm. seaweed on the beach. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't exactly the same village I went back to. It was no. very close. It was a slightly different village. Um, yes, I think that's partly because of my training as an anthropologist. We were um, encouraged to do everything with people, so that as it was partly a fishing community, or it had been a fishing community. Um, it's all changed a bit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought, well, I'll go out and fish for lobsters off the shore mm -hmm. with the lobster fisherman. Yeah. And he was great. He took me out and we hauled lobster pots. And, you know, it was, it's all, there's a chapter about yeah. it in the yeah. book. And so then you I learn had a, how to do that? Yeah, and, I learned yeah. how to do that. Well, I couldn't do it myself, no. but I learned how to help. How to help, And yes. how to not get in the way. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> yes. And then I went out on a trawler mm. for three days, which was um, a bit more alarming for me. Was it? In what yeah. way? Well, um, I, I have a bit of a thing about getting seasick. I'm terrified of, you know, rough sea. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it was rough sea. <laughs> But it was, it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. At first I couldn't get a, a trawler captain to take me because he said, well, no, no women, you know, couldn't hack it. And yeah. uh, women were supposed to be bad luck and all that. Oh, well, they do have traditions like that, don't they? So yeah. Sort of, yeah, yeah. Superstitions, yeah. should I say. Especially for something as dangerous as fishing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of superstitions mm -hmm. around it. But it was great. It was a real man's world. And there <laughs> I was, you know, with my own little bunk in the men's dorm <laughs> mucking in as they say mucking in yeah 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 it was, was great. that hard work um i didn't work so much because it is very dangerous yes. i mean there were all ropes and wires and nets and things machinery all over the place and um, i was there mainly as a spectator yeah. you know and it was good of them to take me. Yes, it was, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. And then, of course, there was the lady collecting the seaweed on the beach. Yes, yes, that. yes, oh. yes. That wasn't actually... I mean, carrageen is collected industrially. It's mm -hmm. used um, in a lot of businesses as a thickening agent and um, for cosmetics and soap mm -hmm. and such like. Um, but she was just gathering it because... Um, she likes to make a milky drink out of it in the evenings. <laughs> and you can also make a kind of pudding. Yeah. It uh, sets like blancmange. Okay. It's, it's called very good Irish for you, moss. It? it is supposed to be very yeah. good for you. Well, any seaweed is supposed to be very good yeah. for you. I mean, we've yeah. been seeing some images there of Donegal as well. It's yeah. beautiful, yeah. beautiful countryside. Yeah, it's it? absolutely gorgeous. Uh -huh. I fell in love with it when I went there on holiday yeah. as a child. Yeah. And I knew, I always, even then, when I was 10 or whatever, I wanted to go back and write a book about it. Oh, lovely. And you've managed to do I've this, I've managed to do it, yes. Have you, uh, or are you working on a, a project here in Andalusia? Are you thinking about it? I, I'm thinking about it. It's yeah. not going to be the same kind of book, though. I don't want to write about Andalusia. No. no. I think it's been done too it's been often done and quite too often. well. Yeah. So, um, no, I think I'd like to write a novel. <laughs> oh yes, that would be yeah, that, yeah. that would be diff took, totally yeah, different from yeah, what you've done. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we look forward to that. Yes, <laughs> but I suppose nearer the time we're looking forward to uh, the gathering, uh, gathering Karagin. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, well, thank you very, very much, uh, thank Monica. You, thank, thank you. Thank you. And if anybody wants to find out further details about your work, then they just go to monicaconnell.co.uk. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. That's all for this afternoon on Mihas International. Back with you at the same time tomorrow. All the latest local news with Gabby Ray. And I'll be back, of course, in the interview section. <laughs>